Hunters out near Mount Hamilton said they watched a Lancer Super ES circling at high speed, banking sharply, and then suddenly plunging nose first into a hillside, all while the engine sounded like it was still at full power. That's a pretty chilling thing to witness, and sadly, the pilot didn't survive. This happened on September 12, 2025, and because the NTSB has only released their preliminary report, we don't have all the answers yet, but we can start looking at the facts we do know and dig into the bigger questions. What could cause a high-performance experimental plane to end up in such a dramatic crash, and what lessons can we actually learn from this? So let's start with what we know from the report. The pilot departed Ryan Field in Tucson, Arizona, heading to San Jose International. This was a personal Part 91 flight. No flight plan filed, just a straightforward cross-country. The flight tracked normally for a while, with ADS-B data showing the plane cruising along at about 8,900 feet. Then, at some point, contact was lost. And here's where it gets really strange. The last solid ADS-B hit was about 242 miles from where the crash actually happened, which leaves a big gap in what we can see on the flight track. By the time the airplane turned up near Mount Hamilton, witnesses described it circling low, getting as close as 300 feet above the ground before rolling hard into a right bank and diving straight into the hillside. That is extremely low to be maneuvering a fast airplane like a Lancair. The wreckage tells us the impact was violent. First contact was with a tree about 12 feet up, and the debris field stretched only about 90 feet. Short, compact, typical of a high-energy crash. The fuselage came to rest inverted, and propeller fragments were scattered along the path, which strongly suggests the engine was making power right up until impact. No fire, no explosion, just a brutal impact. And we can rule out weather as the immediate culprit. Conditions at the time were visual, with 10 miles of visibility, light winds, and no clouds or ceiling issues. So this wasn't a case of flying blind into bad weather. Something else happened here. Now let's talk about the airplane itself, because that context really matters. This was a Lancair Super ES, an amateur-built experimental aircraft. These aren't factory-built, standardized planes. They're kits, assembled by individuals, and while many are beautifully made and perform incredibly well, Performance can vary from one build to another. Control feel, stall behavior, even weight and balance, they can all differ depending on the build. The Super ES in particular is known as a hot rod of the home-built world. It's a fast, high-performance design built around speed and efficiency. But that comes with a price. It can be unforgiving if mishandled, especially at low speeds and high bank angles. Control sensitivity tends to be sharper than what you'd see in a standard Cessna or Piper which means small mistakes can escalate quickly. And when you look at accident history with Lancair models, there's a recurring theme, loss of control, stalls, and spins, often at low altitude where recovery is impossible. That doesn't mean this crash was definitely one of those, but it shows us the risks pilots face when flying aircraft like this. This is why respecting the performance envelope of these planes is so critical. At 8,000 feet, you have options. At 300 feet in a steep turn, you've got no margin at all. It's a narrow safety window. And once you step outside it, recovery is basically impossible. So let's break down those last moments. Witnesses described the airplane circling unusually low in mountainous terrain, dipping down to just a few hundred feet off the ground. That's already an extremely risky place to be in a high-performance airplane. Then came the sharp right bank, which continued into what they described as a nose-down dive. Here's the thing about steep banks at low altitude. Your stall speed goes up and your margin for recovery almost disappears. If the wing stalls in that condition, you don't have the altitude to fix it. That's one possible scenario here. A simple but deadly loss of control. Another angle is spatial disorientation or misjudging terrain clearance. Circling near ridges and valleys can trick your eyes and balance system. What feels like a safe maneuver might actually be pushing the airplane into a corner you can't fly out of. And finally, there's always the possibility of a control issue. 
Experimental aircraft have unique control systems, and failures, even rare ones like flutter or linkage separation, can't be ruled out this early. What we know for sure is that the NTSB didn't find any evidence of fire or explosion, so nothing obvious like an in-flight breakup or engine fire stands out yet. Now, let's zoom out a bit. There are several technical threads investigators will want to pull on. First is engine power. Witnesses said the engine was roaring right to the end, and the propeller damage backs that up. So, this wasn't your typical engine out accident. The airplane hit the ground with power. Then there's the big mystery, the ADSB gap. The last good data point was about 242 miles before the crash site. Was that simply a coverage hole? Or did the airplane have a power or avionics issue? Either way, it leaves a frustrating blind spot for reconstructing the flight path. Terrain and winds also matter here. Mount Hamilton and the surrounding hills can generate unpredictable turbulence and downdrafts, even in otherwise good weather. At low altitude, one hard gust at the wrong time can upset an airplane. Because this was a kit plane, investigators will look closely at its build and maintenance history. Modifications, even small ones, can change handling characteristics. They'll be checking for things like control continuity, any evidence of pre-impact structural issues, and whether the control system behaved as designed. And of course, human factors can't be ignored. This was a long cross-country flight, and fatigue might have been in play. There's also the classic get-home mindset, pushing forward when you should be more conservative. Risk tolerance varies, but... Sometimes the decisions we make late in a flight stack the odds against us. So, what can the rest of us actually take away from this, even before the final report comes out? The biggest thing, flying low over mountains is a gamble you almost never win. A steep bank at 300 feet off the deck gives you zero recovery room. Second, high-performance kit aircraft are incredible machines, but they can bite hard if you let your guard down. Their handling is sharper, their stall margins less forgiving, and their speed means mistakes happen faster. Even seasoned pilots need to respect that. Third, don't underestimate terrain. Sure, the weather was clear that day, but turbulence and downdrafts in valleys can be brutal. Just because the sky looks perfect doesn't mean the air is calm. The real lesson here is about discipline. Maintain safe cruise altitudes, Resist the temptation to maneuver unnecessarily at low levels, and know your personal limits. This isn't about pointing fingers at the pilot. He paid the ultimate price, and the respectful way forward is to use this tragedy as a reminder for the rest of us. So, that's where things stand. A tragic crash, a lot of unanswered questions, and an investigation that's only just begun. The NTSB will continue to tear down the wreckage, analyze pilot history, and dig into all the technical details before we get solid conclusions. In the meantime, what do you think explains the circling and sudden dive that witnesses described? Drop your thoughts in the comments. I'd love to hear different perspectives. And if you found this breakdown helpful, make sure to subscribe. I'll be covering the final report when it comes out, and more importantly, the lessons all pilots can take away from it.